Today's episode is brought to you by Stream by Mosaic, an expert interview transcript library that integrates AI-generated call summaries and NLP search technology so their clients can quickly pinpoint the most critical insights. Start your free two-week trial on their website at www.streamrg.com. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-R-G.com using the promo code MICROCAP. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and make profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. You can follow Planet Microcap on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. You're listening to episode 212. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to tweet at me or shoot me an email at rcraft at snnwire.com. And when you do get a chance, if you like what you hear, please rate and review Planet Microcap on iTunes and Spotify. It really helps provide feedback for me and spread the Microcap message. Special thank you to our sponsors for today's episode, Stream by Mosaic, an expert interview transcript library that integrates AI-generated call summaries and NLP search technology so their clients can quickly pinpoint the most critical insights. Start your free two-week trial on their website at www.streamrg.com. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-R-G.com using the promo code MICROCAP and Quarter, whose mission is to change the way people look at investor relations and create a completely new bridge between companies and stakeholders. Visit your app store of choice to try it out. And that's Quarter, Q-U-A-R-T-R. We are excited to host our first in-person event in nearly three years. The Planet Microcap Showcase is back in Las Vegas on May 3rd through 5, 2022 at Bally's Hotel and Casino. It's time to see each other. It's time to network in person. Let's make it all happen in the entertainment and business capital of the world. For more information, please go to www.planetmicrocapshowcase.com. See you in Vegas. Now for this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I spoke with Ian Hunter. He's the portfolio manager at Hunter Value Capital. We have crossed paths at many microcap investing events over the years, and I was really excited to have him on to, for, for a chat to catch up. Ian is a true blue microcap investor who, when asked about his investing philosophy, he's all about the art of subtraction. In our conversation, we discuss what he means by this his ideal investment, the importance of getting repetition in talking with management, healthy skepticism, and even a little crypto talk. Thank you again for tuning in to episode 212 of the Planet Microcap podcast, and please enjoy my conversation with Ian Hunter. This episode is brought to you by Stream by Mosaic. You can find them at www.streamrg.com. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-R-G.com. Stream is an expert interview transcript library that is starting to become an integral part to investors' research process. They have a number of interviews on a wide variety of companies, including TMT, consumers, industrials, real estate, and more. Stream provides over 300 expert interviews per week, and 70% of their experts are found exclusively on Stream. Stream was built by Mosaic and unlike any other transcript libraries, Stream integrates AI-generated call summaries and NLP search technology so their clients can quickly pinpoint the most critical insights. Stream's community of experts and thought leaders partner with Stream to build their professional brands and expand their industry influence. Right now, there are approximately 8,500 plus call transcripts available. For more information, please visit www.streamrg.com. Welcome back, everybody, to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. You can follow me on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. And my guest today uh, is a gentleman who I've met at many microcap shows. We've always crossed paths. You know, uh, I say I really got to come up with a new phrase for this, but I always say it's a long time coming. So here we go. Yeah. It's a long time coming. And uh, I'm excited to have Ian Hunter, Portfolio Manager at Hunter Value Capital on the show today. Ian. What goes on, man? How you doing? 
Hey, Bobby. Good to have you on here. Thanks for uh, joining me. Oh, I'm gl- it's great to be on. It's great to be on your show. Yeah, yeah I was, I'm so happy to be on your show. This is my inaugural one, and I'm uh, <laughs> I'm taking yours over. <laughs> I love it, man. Well, we're stoked to have you here, and stoked to finally, you know, get a chance to actually talk. It's been a minute. So, um, wh- where are you based, by the way? I'm in Dallas, Texas. You're in Dallas now. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. How, how's it going down there? Are we uh, we're recording this on January 11th, so anything could change by the time this comes out. Yeah, I know. It'll be interesting to find out if uh, the Super Bowl ends up coming to uh, Arlington Stadium as a, as a backup. They just announced they're, they're thinking about doing that today. Oh, that's so. interesting. Oh, instead of LA? What, because some players aren't vaxxed or something? I think, yeah, there's something going on with that. They, they contacted uh, Arlington Stadium and said, can we quickly switch to you guys if we have to? So, um, are, you yeah. on, are you already looking for tickets? Like, just get like, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. I'm mostly concerned about the traffic. That's, that's what I want to watch out for. <laughs> Good stuff, man. Well, listen, uh, you know, again, I'm stoked to have you on here. I, it's been a while since we've caught up, but for those who may not have met you before or know your background, you know, where, where did your passion for investing begin? Oh yeah. That's uh, I guess, you know, that can be a long story or a short story, but I think uh, originally I started investing back in the Great Recession, 2008, 2009, um, personally in the stock market. But um, that, I guess the history for me was I went to NYU business school back in 2005, and that was really where I started getting interested in investing. Um, I've always been actually surprisingly a skeptic toward the concept of investing in the stock markets and, and generating alpha. So I started out um, when I got to NYU. I, I looked at all these uh, all these academic papers. We had access to big databases of academic papers, and I was just really curious because so many of my friends were trying to go into investment banking or work for a hedge fund after they graduated. I was really curious what what is it that that's out there that that has everyone so interested as if it's kind of an e- a place to make easy money on Wall Street. I didn't really know what I wanted to do after business school. <clears throat> I just knew that I had worked as a real estate broker before business school and that wasn't cutting it for me. I wanted to do something <clears throat> intellectually challenging. But um, what I came away with from reading so many academic papers was that there is, uh, in general, the returns that hedge funds put up uh, mostly are related to the amount of risk that they're taking on, and that a lot of that, in most cases, is related to leverage. That was that was my takeaway at that time. Um, and you know, to what extent that's true or not, it definitely got me interested in the topic of investing because. Um, I would take, you know, I think my interest at that time was in the more obscure parts of the market. Uh, distressed investing was one of my favorite classes. I took a, a bankruptcy class with with uh, Ed Altman at the time. Um, and in that paper, it, it, the paper for that class, I was writing about how over leveraged the commercial real estate market was. And this was 2006. Um, and I was, I was just generally a skeptic that all these practitioners out there that were making huge bonuses were actually really delivering a lot of return for the clients. So when I, uh, I took a class from Oswath Demodoran, who's, who I guess is really big on Twitter now, he, uh, in, in his office hours, I was really curious. I asked him, so how is it that the average investor uh, who's going up against these professional money managers who have so much money devoted to resources to get close to management and all the data they need. How can the average investor uh, compete against those guys? And his answer surprised me. He said, well, not only can you compete against them, I think the small investor with a small amount of capital has a big advantage. And so that was that was really not what I was expecting. And uh, so after business school, I, uh, my first job was actually at a rating agency uh, looking at commercial mortgage-backed securities. This was 2007, prior to the crash. And uh, I do remember reading that training manual on how much uh, credit support has to be applied to each of these mortgage-backed securities. And it was you know, some number. And I remember going to the first uh, credit rating meeting and the credit that they assigned to the small or the, the uh, credit support they assigned was so much smaller than what I'd read in the manual. And I asked a, a guy in the team afterwards, I was like, 
why, why is it only half of what the manual said it was? He's like, Oh, that was last summer. That was that credit manual was out of date. You know, this year we only need this much credit support. And that was just kind of, uh, it really raised red flags for me <laughs> and, uh, by the end of the year, or I guess about, uh, within nine months, our whole team was laid off because the credit crunch was starting and it was hitting, you know, ground zero was the mortgage backed securities. So, uh, that, that was, that was kind of the origin of my, you know, that time period is when I was forming my skepticism around investing and in, investing instruments. So, um, it seems like if it, it seems like you didn't lose it though, you know, like it was a healthy skepticism. It was like, it was, it seemed like it was something that you were like, you know, I feel like I'm like in the, your journey of self-discovery. It's like, all right, I think I might be a natural skeptic and right. I want to apply that towards, not just the stock market, but just yeah. investing in general, right? Right. Yeah, that's right, Bobby. I mean, I took a really circuitous route to get where I am today, investing in microcaps. But part of that kind of formative cauldron was looking at the height of the financial uh, buildup in, in speculation in the 2006 and 2007, then the crash. I ended up working for uh, a, a um, equity research shop uh, after that rating agency. And that's really the time when I started investing in the stock market, according to what I had picked up from the motorins class uh, and from the rating agencies. It was interesting in 2008, there were, um, you know, Bear Stearns failed. Uh, uh, Bank of America ended up having to buy out Merrill Lynch because of their, their and also had countrywide uh, financial um, on their books. So um, at that time, the REITs were finally starting to uh, trade, at, uh, you know, kind of really volatile. And I just dove into the REIT space and started looking at what are the, uh, what's the amount of leverage on their balance sheet? How soon are their debt maturities coming due? What's the proportion of uh, loans that are secured versus unsecured? What's the proportion of uh, their balance sheet that's in the riskier uh, you know, development projects? And when I did a matrix of a lot of stocks uh, across those uh, you know, kind of um, aspects, I was just looking for stuff that seemed like you know, was not priced too demandingly for the amount of risk that you were taking. So uh, that was kind of my first taste of, of investing in the stock market. And, and I really enjoyed it. I mean, that, that approach did, did pretty well for me. And I really thought, okay, so there might be some cases where the markets are so inefficient that the average investor can find something interesting there. So, so then what, what eventually was it that it just clicked like, all right, microcaps is my game. That's what yeah. I'm playing. Yeah. Well, uh, after the equity research uh, shop, I I felt uh, like I wanted to get back to what I'd been doing with uh, debt at the the uh, rating agency. So I, I took a role at a global bank, uh, helping them decide which corporate borrowers were the most credit worthy, where they could put their capital. And uh, I was spending my time thinking about what is the chance that this company over the next five years will do well enough to be able to pay back their interest and their, and their debt. And, um, you know, that was just, that happened to be the job that was available to me during the financial crisis. But I did really start focusing on, um, let's look at a company's competitive positioning in the marketplace and what's the likelihood that you're going to be around. Um, but again, it was all this downside perspective. What's, you know, how can I lose? So, um, I realized I was not going to be happy doing debt forever uh, for a bank because I was still really attracted to what's the most obscure part of the market where you know most people are not focusing. So I started getting my you know uh, training for the CFA and passing those tests and trying to position myself for a job on the buy side. Um, the the job that I did and that I took was a private equity firm hired me to help them evaluate the value of their investments on their books. And um, what I, I guess at that point, 
I kind of, I've started listening to manual of ideas. Uh, John Mihaljevic uh, was doing these wonderful um, profiles of the top investors that he, that he knew. And this was 2013 or so. Um, a friend of mine introduced me to Buffett's, uh, you know, annual letters uh, for his partnerships uh, and also gave me Seth Klarman's book, uh, Man- uh, Margin of Safety. So this was kind of that time period where I, where I was really realizing I think I can actually do this myself and being on the inside at that private equity firm, I think that's what made me realize, like, I can see what it's like to run an investment shop. I can probably just go out and try to apply, you know, my specific principles of being pretty risk averse, but looking for obscure things um, on my own. And so, You know, I I think the tipping point to go into microcaps was I read a uh, some class notes from a professor at Columbia Business School, and he said, "Look, guys, you all want to go work in you know the investment world, but I'm going to tell you, trying to find alpha against all these big competitors, you're going to serve yourself much better looking in the small small cap stuff." And the argument was very simple, and it made a whole lot of sense to me, and so. I think the reason that most people from that class might not have gone into microcaps is that it takes a certain entrepreneurial streak in somebody to go into microcaps because almost by default, you're going to have to be starting from scratch in most cases. You're not going to have a lot of big investors beating down your door to put capital with you to invest in microcaps. So I thankfully had that kind of entrepreneurial streak or desire and was willing to just start from zero uh, with uh, just, uh, you know, a few friends and families uh, capital. So that's, that's my long winded description of how I ended up here. I'd like to take a quick second to tell you about this episode's sponsor quarter with quarter, you get frictionless access to conference calls, investor presentations, transcripts, and earnings reports from markets all around the world straight from your pocket for no cost. Quarter's mission is to change the way people look at investor relations and create a completely new bridge between companies and stakeholders. The first step on this journey is to let you, the user, interact with the company's content while you're listening. Visit your app store of choice and try it out today by searching for Quarter. And that's Q-U-A-R-T-R. Now back to the show. No, absolutely. And, and, you know, taking your own personal mindset from where you started and even when you were first getting it, like what were some of the things from your experience when you first started looking at microcaps and then ultimately obviously investing in them that really helped, you know? Um, well, okay. So, uh, Frankly, the, the the things that really got me uh, energized were going to investor conferences, and uh, I know you're uh, you you have the wonderful Planet Microcap uh, conferences, and uh, and it's a total coincidence that that is really the the type of thing that really energized me um, going to those events um, and sitting down with managers, Just realizing you're not alone. Like, oh, there's other investors yeah. that actually look at this stuff too. Whew. Okay, I'm not I'm not crazy. Yeah, that might be it. Is, uh, is seeing that there's other crazy people out there that, that <laughs> care about these fifty million or twenty million dollar market cap companies, um, but also sitting down and seeing that these management teams—they're real, real guys trying to solve real problems, and uh, in in a lot of cases, you can find the ones that have actually shared principles to to what you do. They're not just trying to, you know, iterate to the next great theme with their company and, you know, put the, put the big buzzwords in their 10 Ks. They're actually trying to, you know, carve out a, a real business that's going to have a moat in, in the world. So, um, so I think that really got me energized and I've been kind of hooked on investor conferences to this day and just trying to get in a lot of repetitions of sitting down with management teams um, and thankfully virtually over the past couple of years. I, I can't imagine if we hadn't had Zoom during COVID. Uh, oh, for, for sure. I mean, it's it's fun. I, you know, I had, um, I've had Chris Krug on, Art yeah. of Foken, you yeah. know, Brian Weber, we did a, a, a great round table talking about like what it's been like doing meetings in person. I mean, everyone has their own perspective, but the commonality amongst 
all, all of you guys is the idea of repetition, you know, yeah. and how it, it's just, you, people don't understand what, why me, meeting with these management teams, like, even if you feel like you're just so, you know, you don't know what you're doing, you don't know what you're talking about. Like it's almost better because it's, if you're going to play in the micro cap game, listen, you can, you can go, you can take a quick accounting class. You'll be able to figure, or not even, you, you can figure it out pretty damn quickly, you know, but it's that side that takes the time. Yeah, totally. You know? So, I mean, what was, I mean, what, what were some of your early learning lessons in, in doing some of these meetings and getting the yeah. reps in? Oh, well, I, yeah, actually a good example is um, <laughs> my first investor meeting. I met this, uh, I met the CEO who got invited to go to the same dinner that I was at. I ended up sitting next to him and the time that I spent next to him being just kind of wowed with his stories uh, and, and his vision for the company. Um, I noticed that really influenced me to like the company and I ended up putting some of my personal money into it and uh, it went nowhere. I, I probably lost 90% of my capital over the next year. And so what I realized is I don't necessarily need to meet the management team of every company I invest in because I know that I am actually very vulnerable to being you know, convinced by a very persuasive manager. But the point for me of meeting investor teams is just getting in those repetitions of understanding companies and learning about an industry, whether or not this is the company in that industry that I'm going to be invested in. Um, if you can get, you know, kind of a, a bunch of examples in your mind of this management team talked about their company this way. Here's what they ended up doing a few quarters later. Here's how they're doing, you know, a year or two late years later. Um, that's enough for me to keep getting in those reps. But I can, I, I would say in my top 10 companies, they're probably only half of the companies who I've actually met with management. And I think the reason for that is a lot of times you have companies that are really good at disclosing and their, their presentations are very clear. Um, they're not they're not making it really complex. Um, so I think in those cases, I'm more comfortable. I, I prefer actually a case where I can get enough information about the risk reward and the probability that it's going to work out just from what's printed um, or from reading the transcripts. Um, but uh, so it's, it's weird that balance. Like I know my, my, my weakness is probably coming away from a management meeting, just really fired up about what they've told me they're going to do. Yeah. I've, I've felt that before. It, it, like, especially it, for me, it's when I'm, I, I sit in a presentation and like, because most of them are incredibly dry and yeah. you know, it, it is what it is, right. You're, you know, there's 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 the number you know yeah. like it's, it's it can be it can be kind of dry right. you know so like i've 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 gotten totally just like whoa when you've yeah. when you have a presentation where you have like a charismatic ceo i don't know that's probably been my number one lesson is like just charisma yeah. does not equate to realized value <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, and it's uh, and I, it's not like I have a rule of don't invest with a, a manager team that I've met with, for example. You know, I, I'll sure. I'll come away from a meeting with a comp with company management, and I'll say, you know, so given these data points, uh, you know, that I've read and from what uh, they've told me, you know, did they clarify my understanding of the business? Um, and then you're stacking it up against the opportunities that are already in your portfolio or, or on the bench waiting to waiting for a spot. But, uh, you know, it's, I, I think you have to, you have to just really try to gird yourself against being too influenced by, uh, somebody who's overly promotional. And so for me, a red flag is when a management team is very promotional of the stock itself, um, rather than of the business. Um, or tries to kind of change the types of uh, KPIs that they're uh, reporting or the timing of when they report their uh, expectations of how the quarter went, if they're only talking about the revenues and not so much about the other KPIs that they told you about previously. So, uh, you know, there is totally a lot to learn from directly interacting with management. It just doesn't always make me want to, uh, 
tick that box with each investment that I make. So what are some of the things that you learned that are on the on the, the green flag side, right? The the good things, the quality things you're like, oh, okay, like that, yeah, that ended up working out. Yeah, I mean, I I think the best uh some of the conversations I've had with management uh where I came away feeling this is, you know, this is really worth investing is is when uh, they were able to clarify some kind of KPI that that they have not been reporting, and and yet for me it's kind of a pivotal KPI, such as um, you know there's a mining company that a, a a Bitcoin mining company that I invested in last year, and by talking to management, I was able to find out what is the amount of time that it's taking them to get their cash back on each miner that they purchase. Um, that had not been clear to me from reading their presentations. They're very good at disclosing everything, but that one had not jumped out at me if they were disclosing it at all. And so when I came back and used that as a data point in my estimate of what's their return on capital is pretty easy to see that, you know, they're, if they're getting paid back fully in some cases, six months, some cases, 12 months, some cases, 18 months, you know, on average, they're getting their cap, their cash back pretty quickly. So that's, you know, there's sometimes little KPIs that, you know, uh, that you can pick up on that maybe it is being disclosed, but it hasn't been highlighted to you the same way. Got it. All right. Well, I'm going to take a step back because I mean, listen, we could talk about talking with management teams for, for days. Right. Um, but I, you know, for those who, who may not have follow you or, or have access to your investor deck, you know, what, what would you say is, is your and and your firm now Hunter Value Capital your your investing philosophy? Uh, I guess the my my main philosophy would be if if you can in, in investing if you can make it an art of subtraction where um, you've got these massive tailwinds in microcaps where over whatever time period you're looking at in some cases it might be. 2% outperformance per year to 4%, depending on the academic studies. Um, but that smallest portion of the, of the market caps, um, the smallest 20% does naturally tend to outperform, even accounting for the bankruptcies that occur and, and uh, the frauds, all that stuff. So um, if you've got that tailwind, then um, what can you do by doing some extra due diligence to really understand a company and eliminate some of the things that are probably tend to be, you know, red flags for fraud. That's the first thing I think you have to look at. But I guess the philosophy is it just makes sense to have a portion of your capital in uh, an actively managed microcap strategy where you have that tailwind and you're just trying to filter out the companies that are probably going to drag you down. And so if that if you're able to do that, then you can, you know, perhaps get better than 2%, 3%, 4% outperformance over the, you know, the large gaps. Very good. And then, and then, okay, now I want, I want to understand what that ideal investment then looks like for you. You know, what, what are some of your criteria going along that lines of, of now, you know, putting that philosophy to work? Yeah. So, uh, so I am, my criteria for, for an investment is really, I, I need to have, uh, a reasonable expectation that they can uh, do a three x to five x within the four to five years that I'm that I'm holding them. Um, I'm not committed to any time frame um, of holding a company, but of course, it's much better if you are looking for companies that have the runway, um, you know, the their share of a of a large and growing addressable market that can give them you know, a five X or more, um, you know, it's very, I think there's no shortage of, of companies that would like you to believe that they have a five X or a 10, 10 X in the innings, but, um, can you use reasonable assumptions and get to something like that? So I'm not interested in companies that look like they're 20% undervalued or even 50% undervalued. Um, I, that tends to make me steer away from NAV plays where, you know, you've got these <clears throat> real estate assets and uh, it looks like they're trading at, you know, 50% of what that market value of their real estate assets might be. 
that's all interesting. And I kind of started out that way um, in my investing career, but I've evolved to where I only want a big runway ahead, such as a, a 5X um, or, or more. So, um, <clears throat> and, and, you know, the, the ways that you can, uh, when you set that bar pretty high, that actually, I think it helps you uh, to, you know, only, <laughs> I, 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 I often say to myself, Get, be okay with letting yourself look at a company, you don't invest in it and you see them go up 3X within a couple of years or 5X or whatever. Be okay with that because what that means is frustrating as it is to see a company you know, explode the way a lot of companies have in the last two years, in fact, um, that just means you're fishing in the right ponds. It means the types of companies you're interacting with that are coming across your desk, you're, you're tending to filtrate you know, that that flow down to the ones that do have that potential to go up, uh, you know, be multi-baggers. So, um, but I, I think you really want to li limit or, or really try to maximize your uh, potential returns for the amount of time that you're spending on invest, you know, investing that time and in, in reviewing them. So that's why it's not enough for me to say, well, this company's got the potential to go up 50% in the next year that's, if that's all they do, then, uh, you know, that's great, but I shouldn't have probably spent much time researching it. Right. Well, what's your time horizon then? I mean, are you, are you more on the long, like longer than a year <laughs> kind of thing, or do you look at all different opportunities? Well, I guess what a different way to think of that is what's the amount of time that I'm comfortable holding onto a stock without seeing it hit my target. And I would say, you know, two years is probably that time frame where if a company has not been showing progress along reaching that uh, break-even profitability, you know, a lot of the companies I invest in are pre-profitability, but I'm expecting it to happen within the next two or three quarters. Um, if a company actually takes, you know, three or four more quarters and they're still not there, um, I'm obviously reviewing the situation to figure out what is it? Was it something extenuating or was it something that I really misunderstood the story? Um, but yeah, I think the longer you can afford to be patient, the bigger advantage you have over most of the market participants who are looking for something very short-term focused. Um, but thankfully I've been able to align myself with clients, uh, my investors who do share that long-term view and they're gonna, you know, they're prepared to see their portfolio drop in value by 30, 40, 50% along the way, um, before Ooh. they <laughs> get to that, <laughs> that level. Um, we, we haven't seen that yet, uh, but uh, we're, we're, we're all prepared for that. Uh, hopefully I, I speak for my clients that we, that we're prepared for it. And we understand that, uh, you know, when, if our portfolio is down 50%, then, um, presumably if we've been making the right decisions, that's just a better opportunity than, than if, uh, we've made some big mistakes. Got it. So one, one thing you, you mentioned that you tend to fish, it, it sounds like in, you know, obviously re revenue generating companies, but it, you'd said uh, even uh, pre-profitability is sometimes that's, that's okay as well. So do you tend to yeah. focus more on growth, growthy type names or, or like kind of that hybrid growth value, you know, what, what, yeah. I, yeah what, what do you think? Great question. Um, I, I think you know, I tend to find uh, I, I, what I'm trying to find in a company in most cases is a company that's doing pretty well right now with the business that they have. And there's an opportunity they're exploring to really grow it. Um, and that, you know, based on the price today, if that existing business is not unreasonably priced, it doesn't have to be a bargain, but the existing business should be something that is is not priced too much, like people don't, you know, it's not widely, widely known and, and it's not a, a high flying, you know, uh, talked about on Twitter every day kind of company. So if I can get that business for reasonable um, value and then take that optionality with the, the, the growth uh, that they're pursuing, um, that tends to be my sweet spot that's most attractive to me. Gotcha. All right. So 
you know, we were talking offline um, about how it's, it just so happens that, you know, some of the opportunities you've recently been, you know, are now uh, current holdings as well. We won't name names, but you did talk about, you know, looking at a Bitcoin mining company. And I think you told me about 15% um, of your portfolio is, is kind of in crypto related crypto adjacent kind of stuff. So yeah. love to hear your, your thesis there being like, you know, with your skeptic background, I'm now labeling you as Mr. The Skeptic Investor. Like, what? How, how did you get there? That takes that must yeah. have taken a lot. Yeah, uh, I, I, um, I, I, I guess I am trying to be very humble about my uh, my understanding of the crypto economy. Um, I know enough to not like mostly most of what I see, most of what I hear about uh, crypto on Twitter and elsewhere. I, I I hate the amount of noise that uh, that comes through uh, the you know the filters through my various uh, forms of media. Um, it's just got all the hallmarks of the you know the the manias, panics, and crashes uh, book uh, by Kindleberger. And um, so why why the heck would I be investing in companies that are uh, you know building their business in that economy? Well, uh, so. My thoughts on crypto are that the 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 conversation around it is is really distorted by um, a lot of young people who have no experience with crashes and they have flooded into this uh, this kind of libertarian uh, dominated um, uh, space where people like to be. Uh, you know, anti-central banks and, and uh, you know, we're going to have this beautiful future world where, you know, everything is decentralized and we don't have to rely on uh, Ben Bernanke or whoever is uh, throwing helicopter money out there. Um, there's this libertarian ideal that I think is driving a lot of this that is probably pumping it way too much. So the exposure that I take to crypto um, is that there are some really, uh, there's real technology behind it. Um, and the simplest idea for me, uh, if we just look at Bitcoin, for example, the simplest idea I've heard is um, this, uh, this idea that blockchain represents computers making credible commitments. So that's the innovation behind Bitcoin is that um, previously we didn't, you know, you could have algorithms, computer programs that could make commitments, but anyone can come in and say, well, yes, uh, this, this instrument uh, commits to not produce more than 20 million tokens or whatever, but uh, you know, we can just go in and reprogram that. So the innovation with Bitcoin was that you could decentralize the ledger of all the transactions that happened so that one person can't presumably come in and change that. So that's a credible commitment that computers can now make. It's a very simple idea. And I don't have to take a view on whether Bitcoin's value is going to uh, hit 100,000 or if it's going to hit 15,000. I just have to believe that enough people out there are going to find that asset class worth putting some of their capital in. And I think it's, I think if you simplify the thesis to that idea, I think it's very easy to say that some portion of, of the population, especially the younger generation, is going to find the attractiveness of um, something that's like gold, but is uh, digital. And so it doesn't have a lot of the, the, the issues and problems around uh, uh, actually physically having exposure to it. So um, I won't go further on that topic because, you you know, there's way too much info about Bitcoin out there. But, but I will say that uh, in, in, from an investing perspective, me as a microcap investor, I've found a couple of interesting uh, companies that I mentioned the mining company. So um, I'm looking at the probability with that company. What's the worst case that, uh, you know, if Bitcoin drops to $15,000, how profitable is this company that is generally going to be making money with Bitcoin going up or going down? Um, because they're they're capturing the spread between the mining revenue and the cost of running all those those machines. But are they are they actually? Because one thing when I've looked at Bitcoin mining companies and the the common dumb question that we all ask is like, well, all right, the spreads are there clearly, but are they actually selling it? You know, or are they just holding it and then it just ends up being a loss leader until they eventually then finally sell yeah. some of these coins? Like, because how does that work? 
That's a great point. And um, that is frankly, one of the um, criteria I've had in, in talking to the management teams of, of Bitcoin miners is if I ask them, you know, what's your philosophy on holding the Bitcoin? And they say, oh, we're holders. I'm already really turned off because why do I need them to hold it for me? I can, I can buy Bitcoin myself if I want it. Um, and to me, that suggests that they don't have a capital allocation mindset that, you know, the decision to hold it or sell it should be similar to the decision to uh, raise cash, to, to issue a dividend, to buy back stock. All of that should be done on the basis of what's the highest forward IRR that we're going to get. It, it, it's, you know, the, it, it's all a mosaic. It, you can't just, you know, say, oh, we're just going to hold on. So, so um, this company that I own does does sell the Bitcoin. Um, so that made it through my, my that filter for me. Um, and I think they're still uh, so small that they're that the price of the company is still very small compared to the um, the amount of profits they're going to have in the future. They are they have a, a niche of offering really like I think it's a hundred percent green um, energy deals uh, to to fund the operating costs so they can get it uh, you know they can get the electricity for under. Uh, three and a half cents in in most cases they seem to have a pipeline of future deals to 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 buy more uh, green energy um, and that's you know all the management teams are are talking about that because that's the hot topic these days is green green energy but um, I think this this company has some credibility behind what they say and and what they end up doing so that's why I have uh, I still have them in the portfolio. I, I still think probably at least a five x, um, perhaps more over the next few years. I mean, do they do they also talk about mining for other stuff too, or it, or is that not important to you? Would you would you rather it just be one coin, or do you want them to mine? For yeah, yeah, more that's. Stuff? Uh, I, I mean, so you're hitting on another issue that you that you see with a lot of management teams is whatever is the hottest thing, they will try to find a way to put that word in their disclosures. If it's sounds like natural resources. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, I found that, that this company is pretty um, focused on Bitcoin. Uh, they, they, I think initially were playing around with uh, some, um, some alternative coins uh, at the very early stages, just to, just to see what they could do with uh, with a couple of miners that that uh, that don't uh, focus on Bitcoin, but um, in general, I it really turns me off if a company starts adopting the next greatest thing. I mean, you need to figure out what you're good at and focus on that and do really well at that. So um, there is a company that I did invest in um, and have since exited that was focused on staking, um, which in other words, they would buy the crypto tokens that were stakeable. So it's mining, but it's just, it's not using physical uh, electricity to do it. Um, the, the revenue for, for uh, the proof of stake is just from the holders of the tokens locking it up. And this company was doing that. And when I bought them, they were trading at maybe 20% premium to the underlying token value. And I thought, Am I comfortable with that 20% premium? Well, why am I even paying a premium? But then I thought, well, if these guys are getting yields of you know 15% uh, or so on the actual staking that they're doing, then they are taking risk by locking up their tokens. So we it is actually reasonable to value those tokens they hold slightly above their trading cost because that risk is being locked up. And so I guess a different way to say that is that you don't want to pay a premium for any asset that is purely fungible like cash. But if you're if you're actually generating yield by locking it up, then it is reasonable to kind of discount that yield back. So I bought them and then uh, pretty soon they were all about the metaverse. They were they totally pivoted and the stock went way up and I, I'd only you know, had a starter position in there. So it wasn't anything significant for my portfolio, but I exited because I felt like they were really losing their, uh, their focus. Oh man. <laughs> Gotta love those, right? Like, yeah, you, you can't get too comfortable with, with companies in the microcap space. You, you have to really, 
stay on top of that story and be, be nimble in your opinions. Yeah. Well, my last question on, on crypto topic is because you, you're hitting on something that's kind of interesting to me that I think about a lot when I try and think about how I feel about crypto. And for full disclosure, I own some Bitcoin, so I'm not, I own it to, I like monitoring it. And I think it's interesting. I'm probably never going to sell it just because. Yeah. I, why? And um, I, I own some as well. Yeah. You know, but um, what's always been interesting to me is like when anybody asks me my opinion on crypto, it's that I feel like it's a it's a it's a not so much a, um, a question about whether I think it, about Bitcoin. My my whole thing has always been like the technology itself is there's clearly some applications. I feel like some people listen to this are probably like, okay, enough. But like, but but as somebody that's actually investing in some of these companies that are just mining for the coin itself, I mean, how do you feel about the actual long-term thought process on Bitcoin and maybe even ETH? And then, you know, the underlying tech, because I'm a believer in the tech. I think that there's clear applications and, and that is where everything's going to go. But yeah, totally. The coins, yeah. I don't know. I, I see where you're going. I, I mean, I think um, Ethereum uh, as being kind of the Legos of, of, of finance um, is, is an interesting way for them to position themselves. I think with um, some of these, you know, there's the Lindy effect, right? Which is where the, the longest running, you know, however long something has been um, popular or the value has been ex- generally accepted by investors, then it's likely to continue to be acceptable. So I think, you know, you're safest in, in uh, instruments like Bitcoin and Ethereum, but do I, as an investor managing people's capital, I only want that upside to just be the icing on the cake. So um, I think I can find really good investment opportunities in these kind of crypto economy companies. Um, I call them blockchain beneficiaries. Um, one example of that is a, is a brokerage, a publicly traded brokerage that I um, found when it was still a micro cap. It's, it's, it's now it's a, I guess a, a mid cap company. But um, my thesis with buying this company was that I don't have to believe that, that those prices are going to go up. I don't have to believe that Bitcoin and Ethereum and all these others will do a lot better. But a few things that if I think are true, then this company is a really good bargain, which are, um, do I think that inflation is likely to continue at some, uh, you know, over, over the next, uh, you know, decade, probably, probably going to continue to see debasement of the dollar. If that's the case, then you're probably going to see more and more people wanting to own those assets. If that's the case, then the, the, the values probably will go up. But even if they don't, even if the values just go up and go down and just keep making round trips, a brokerage is profiting off of all of those, uh, you know, trading fees. Um, on top of that, with this brokerage, you had a lot of growth that appeared to be coming in the future because there are not that many publicly traded um, crypto brokerages that are trying to adhere to the law. And you have a lot of these decentralized exchanges or these offshore exchanges and brokerages that SEC is pretty unhappy with. And uh, regulation in general is going to push people toward the companies that have been trying to adhere to the law from the beginning. So that's that's another reason that I felt like the downside for that crypto brokerage was pretty well protected. Um, but so I, I, I don't know if that answers your question about the, the viability of the technology itself. But I think going back to the computers making credible commitments, that has big ramifications for um, a lot of things in industry, being able to track products through the, um, uh, through the logistics uh, pathway to, to reaching um, their final destination. If you don't have to trust the person who uh, has uh, filled out the sheet that comes along with that product and says, here's, you know, here's what was paid for it and, and here's where it came from. Here's what how it was sourced. If you don't have to trust that, if you can trust a blockchain, that's just one simple example. Um, obviously, with uh, clearing uh, in, in the financial industry, all the the um, points where people have to touch uh, uh, just a, a simple trade that goes through and three day clearing, all that stuff, um, that's got a lot of potential to be innovated, uh, uh, you know, through blockchain, and that's where DeFi comes in. Um, so I, I, you know, I, 
I have opinions about those, but I don't really like to uh, really dwell on those too much because I think that upside is great if it happens, but I just want to focus on investments where I can be agnostic about that upside. But if it happens, it's probably going to do, it's probably going to make my investments do better. Listen, you're proving the point that Satoshi was probably a value investor. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe, you know, some people think. He but certainly I, not sought much attention for himself. And I, and I, <laughs> and I respect that about him. <laughs> very much. Very much so. Very cool. All right. So that, that was, a, I, I really enjoyed that, that uh, whole thing on crypto. I think that's, that's fascinating and, and how you kind of more or less arrived there. So, you know, uh, when we're going back to your research process a little bit, you know, um, as when, let's say once you've identified a potential new investment, it's met all your criteria. Um, is it crucial for you? You know, obviously you talk to a lot of management, but prior to meeting them, you know, do you go through your whole process and then go and meet them? Or is it kind of like, all right, I'm going to meet a whole bunch of management teams and then, you know, put them through my, my filtration process. Like how, how does that, how does that work? Well, uh, so on the topic of sourcing the ideas, I get a lot of ideas from, um, uh, you know, people in my network who I've found have similar, uh, you know, uh, similarly skeptical uh, viewpoints on what they invest in. And um, I, I have a few people in my circle who invest very differently than, than me in some cases, but we actually share a lot of viewpoints on others. So um, I found that introducing ideas to them that are attractive to me and, and having them, you know, kind of take the opposing viewpoint from me can help dissuade me from making an investment if I, if I realize, yeah, that's, that's something I really wasn't looking at, that, that aspect of risk. Um, so I find ideas through that circle a lot. I find ideas through the investor um, meetings, um, investor conferences, but my process uh, is, it's not as formal as a, as a pure checklist. I just have to have a, a, a feeling that the, you know, probability weighted uh, likelihood that it's going to go up, you know, at least to five X within a few years. I'm kind of, uh, you know, I, I can be very nimble. If I see an idea like that, that just makes a lot of sense, it can be just within a few days, I have started a position. Um, it does take a while for me to buy into a position fully. And so that can happen over many, many months. Um, I'm, I'm quite happy to buy a, a stock more as it's gone up, as it's proven itself uh, to uh, you know, if the management team said they were going to do something and then that comes true, the stock's going to be up a lot, but I'm happier buying much more then, than on the other hand, putting all my money in at the, at the beginning and just hoping, you know, on pins and needles that I was right about this investment thesis. Very good. All right. So Ian, we're, we're kind of rounding the bend here a little bit on our interview today. So I want to ask my, my favorite question. I love asking everybody. So what would you say is an investing experience that really, changed your career affected you the most that that it's one one of those that you always go back to like wow that there yeah we yeah <laughs> uh okay well yeah that's an interesting one it can, I, and it can be more than one if you okay know. um i i would say one that really has made me think a lot was was actually in february of 2020 um, and I don't want to dwell on this one too much because there's 2020 just distorted so many people's, um, uh, perspectives on investing. It was, it became really easy to do well that year. But, um, I, I think the, the reason this investment in particular was interesting to me was that I saw what was happening with COVID. I did some, you know, I built an Excel spreadsheet in, in early February saying, if we keep having this kind of uh, non-linear growth in infect infection rates, we could potentially see X number of infected people in, uh, you know, within three, four months. And people don't seem to be taking that seriously. So I bought some puts on the S&P index that were, um, you know, way out of the money. And within only three, four weeks, they had shot way up. And so I don't want to dwell on that too much because it's not a very repeatable strategy to look for mispriced options, especially puts, um, 
but it did show me that uh, you really should be thinking about um, where volatility and, and extreme outcomes might be mispriced. And it's, it can be okay to place a small bet on something that has a big chance of just t- totally failing. It, I, I could have been completely wrong about the S&P dropping over the next month. Um, and I would have lost that bit of capital, but I only put in, you know, it was probably 1% of capital. But the other reason that that whole thing was interesting to me is the way it changed my behavior over the next few months, because um, when most people's portfolios were down a whole lot, I think I was down at the worst, maybe 10% um, for a very short period. Um, but it caused me to be able to sit there and look at a lot of things with a much more kind of benign uh, view on, uh, on the opportunities that were coming across my desk, rather than if my portfolio had been down 40% and I was just panicking. So it was an interesting exercise for me to feel, how do I feel when, you know, when I'm, when I'm actually okay in a down period. And I think the way that influenced me is today, I invest in companies that I think have, uh, well, I'm, first of all, I'm a little more diversified than I was back then um, because I don't want to, to, to experience that extreme drop that I saw happen in the market. I want to be able to, not have to put so much writing on one individual position. I'd say I am still pretty concentrated. I've got the top, uh, I'd say top 12 stocks are about 75% of my portfolio, but that's more diverse than, uh, than I was when I first started out. So long answer, but I, I think that investment just taught me that I, I make better decisions if I'm not, you know, uh, if I'm not exposed to so much downside. And I, I'm sure you have a lot of investors on here who are much more concentrated with me and, are, and would think I'm a big chicken uh, for not wanting to uh, be exposed to big downside. But um, that's that's what I took away from that taste of, of a speculative thing that seemed to be really mispriced. I did get it right and it could have gone completely wrong, but it taught me the, the way that feels um, when you have not been super exposed to downside. Um, it helps you make better decisions. Maybe that's not anything I can, uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't draw much conclusion from that, but uh, it's definitely had me mulling that over a lot since that time period. Very good. All right. So then to close this out here, you know, my last question for you, what, what advice would you have for, for new investors right now, whether they're looking at anything that you're interested in that we've talked about today, crypto, investing, microcaps, the, the works? Well, um, I, I would say that I think this time period we're in right now um, has, uh, I, I think about this quite frequently, our perception of the distribution, the frequency distribution of a lot of outcomes in the world is really being distorted by social media. I think that uh, in, you know, before Twitter came along or, or Facebook, um, the frequency that one of us would have somebody that uh, we heard about making a 10x on their stocks um, was much less frequent. But today we hear about that all the time. And that distorts our, our um, animal brains into thinking that that kind of outcome is much more common than it, tip, than it really is. You, you, I don't know if that makes sense, but you know, Twitter is a filtration mechanism to filter the most you know, kind of surprising ideas up to the top. And so our brains are constantly getting hit with surprises. This is no, nowhere more clear than in the, the crypto Twitter, um, I think, you know, people are just, they, they think it's a get rich quick uh, uh, thing that they can all have an, have access to. So I guess my advice around that is try your best to separate yourself from the reality that you think you're experiencing through social media and, and uh, all the, the mechanical uh, sources of, of news, because what you're hearing is totally distorted from the actual real base rate of what people are experiencing out there. Um, I don't know if that if that's useful. No, to, that's but. incredibly useful. It's a good, healthy reminder. I mean, look, uh, get outside your your echo chamber. Right. right? Yeah. It's, uh, you're you're very concise at these ideas. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I, it's something I, I, I talk about, I think about it quite a bit, you know, especially, you know, I'm on Twitter, I, I, you know, I post, I don't post a lot. I just post our content, but like, it, I, well, I, I my next podcast with you as my guest again, uh, we're going to hit so many more topics because you are so much more concise than me. You know, <laughs> Ian, it's been an absolute pleasure joining you on the pod today. I really do. I, you're a great host. Thank um, you. I really just, you, you just, you <laughs> I, I'm feel so comfortable. <laughs> I'm going to give you the floor a lot more next time. <laughs> no, I think people would prefer I talk a little less, <laughs> but that's besides the point. So with that, Ian, where can people go and find more information on you, follow you, uh, get more info on your fund? And, and the yeah. Uh, my website is huntervalue.com. And uh, I think uh, on Twitter, I'm pretty easy to find uh, Ian Hunter, uh, Hunter Value Cap. Very cool. Well, Ian, absolute pleasure, man. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Bobby. I really, really do appreciate it. Absolutely. Stay good luck. Stay safe and uh, look forward to seeing you in person soon. Yeah, you too. And good luck with your baby. Oh, I, thanks, you guys are expecting soon. Good luck with that, man. Thanks. <laughs> see you All right. See ya. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast podcast.